So in 2018, a graduate student in my lab published a paper in Nature showing that in the face of a physical threat, there are three options. You can obviously freeze, you can retreat, or you can move forward. And the moving forward response actually triggers activation of a connection in the brain to the dopamine circuitry of the brain and makes it more likely that you're gonna be able to move forward in the future. Now, what was interesting to us was that not only is forward action rewarded at a neurochemical level, which then sets you up for more forward action, but the highest level of agitation and stress was associated with moving forward. We always think, well, if I just calm myself enough, I'll be able to move forward. Right. But it's the exact opposite, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so people who are paralyzed in fear or that have a hard time initiating, sometimes the key is to raise the level of stress and agitation. This is why deadlines are so effective. Right. This is why fear is so effective. This is why that deer gets up out of its, you know, mm. nice little den and starts to move because it feels a certain level of agitation. If that agitation isn't high enough, we will not move forward. And so, especially in the US, you know, we have a culture in which stress has been created. You know, these ideas around stress are that, is that it's terrible for us, when in fact, stress is designed to move us forward towards these action steps that are rewarded, which then move us forward and so on. So what is the process of, of combating that, you know, monkey mind that is, you know, running whatever narrative that's keeping you stuck. Like, it's easy to say, like, just move, you gotta take the action. Sure. But a lot of people still, despite understanding that, intellectualizing that, are unable to, you know, basically act as if. Yeah, I think we're dealing with two general categories of people who have problems with motivation and focus. And I think we've failed to decide, um, excuse me, I think we failed to describe the fact that there are two groups and not one. We think, well, I need to calm myself enough to move forward. I think, and then other people say, well, no, you need to kind of ramp yourself up to move forward. Here's what, the way I conceptualize it based on the data that I'm aware of. Some people are just hypo aroused. They're just not motivated enough. And those people would benefit greatly from cultivating practices like super oxygenated breathing. Mm -hmm. So this is something along the lines of like tumo type breathing. So rapid, and we look at this in the lab, we're actually running a human study on this now. So 25 or 30 deep breaths through the nose and out through the mouth, then exhaling the breath and holding, learning to how to self-generate adrenaline. That's what you're doing yeah, when you're doing some that. Some version of the Wim Hof yeah, technique. Or that's what, what that is. Brian McKenzie talks about. Right, a, a, an ice bath is doing the exact same thing. Stimulating adrenaline response, it, it actually improves the immune system. There's a mm -hmm. published paper on this, releases adrenaline, which buffers the immune system against infection. But getting good at taking yourself from low, low energy to higher energy, and then learning how to compress your focus. And I'll talk about the focus thing in a minute. Some people are so agitated, the monkey mind, they got too many things going on and they're thinking, okay, they're trying to sit down and write. I suffer from this and I'm feeling like, wait, I've also got this person I need to connect with and I'm kind of dro being drawn off course by not being able to put the blinders on. For people that have that issue, I think learning how to calm the nervous system is very powerful. And the best way that I know how to do that is based on two studies, one published in Nature, one published in Cell Reports recently, showing that physiological size, there's actually a thing in the literature called physiological size, are one of the fastest ways to bring our overall levels of autonomic arousal down. And a physiological sigh is a two inhales followed by an extended exhale. So it's like, it's not just a deep breath, it's two inhales, followed by an exhale, mm. okay? And the, what, that, what that does, and this has been shown several times now in humans and other species as well, is it dilates the, the little sacs of the lungs and that second inhale dilates them a little bit more and it pulls a little bit of carbon dioxide out of the bloodstream so that when we exhale, we offload the maximum amount of carbon dioxide and it perfectly adjusts the ratio of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the bloodstream and lungs. And sometimes it only takes one of these double inhale exhales. Sometimes somebody needs to do two or three, but that's the fastest way to bring the autonomic nervous system down. A lot of people need such a tool because I think we talk a lot about meditation and tools for calm. And you know, I can go to Esalen for a weekend and get a massage, I'm gonna feel very good. But then when I'm thrown back in real life, I need something that's gonna work in real time, what I call a real time tool. And most people don't know how to control their autonomic nervous system because it's complicated. I can't control my liver function. I can eat, that will calm me, but 
that has complicated, you know, issues with it too, if I'm just eating to calm yeah. myself. So the diaphragm is the one skeletal muscle organ that was internally, right? We've got obviously skeletal muscles designed to move things. It's a skeletal muscle organ, unlike the spleen, the liver, the heart, et cetera. It was designed to be moved vol voluntarily. And these physiological size are actually occurring fairly regularly during sleep to adjust our levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen. And there's a recent study showing that in claustrophobia, this is the breathing pattern that people default to, mm. to try and offload wow. that carbon dioxide. So, whereas there are a lot of really interesting um, breathing techniques, Wim Hof, Brian McKenzie does great work, uh, Patrick McEwen, you know, the, uh, Laird and Gabby, the tons of, of people doing really interesting things out there. My lab has been focused on what are the neural circuits that are designed to achieve particular states that happen to impinge on and capture diaphragm function. And so the reason I think breathing is so powerful is that everyone has a diaphragm and it's the immediate link to the body. A lot's been made of the vagus nerve, you know, uh -huh. oh, the vagus is the path between the body and mind, but the vagus is very slow. The vagus nerve calming is what you experience when you eat a really rich, a carbohydrate rich meal, or you're, you've had a long day and, you're, and you put your feet up and you're finally relaxing. It takes minutes to hours to kick in. Whereas the diaphragm is real-time control over your brain state. So the brain knows what the body is doing by how fast the diaphragm is moving. It knows yeah. its overall activation state. So when you breathe quickly, those 25 or 30 breaths, the brain says, oh, I must be alert. I'm gonna start secreting some noradrenaline. And when you breathe slowly, that level of noradrenaline drops down. So it sounds so simple, but I think it's only in the last two or three years that my lab and Mark Krasnow's lab at Stanford and other labs elsewhere in the world have started to identify the neurons in the brain that are linked to breathing and how those two things relate to one another. And mm. I think everybody should have a kit of tools yeah. that they can use to bring themselves down and ramp themselves up.